Thank you for joining me today for the study of a very special passage in the Word of God. I wonder if I ask you if you could tell me what the next prophetic event is on God's calendar for this world that we know about. Many things could happen, but the next event that is defined for us in the Word of God is really pretty clear, and it's something that is the blessed hope of every person who's a member of the family of God. I want to remind you of the words of the Apostle Paul in chapter 2 of the book of Titus. In verse 13, he says, We are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Yes, that's the event that I'm speaking of, and we call it the rapture of the church. If you guessed correctly on that and know that that is the next event, my next question is, could you tell someone who asks you where to look in the Bible to look at this special event? There are actually three major passages that are given to us in the Bible regarding this. They're all obviously in the New Testament because the church was not revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. They knew there about the the second coming of Christ, but they did not know about the rapture of the church. So that was not a hope for the saints in the Old Testament economy. There are a lot of references to the rapture. We've just read one of them in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. But the the three major passages are actually found in John chapter 14, then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. I want today for us to turn for a few moments to that passage in John 14, verses 1 through 3 especially, Verses 1 through 6 are so important, but especially the focus on verses 1 through 3 as we see our Lord speaking to his disciples in a very intimate setting the night before his crucifixion. And this passage that we are in, we call the Upper Room Discourse. It's a very important address or a sermon of our Lord as he talks to his disciples because it gives to us a lot of information about the church age. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you look at the Olivet Discourse, they are important for other reasons and give us a lot of information about the future as well. But John chapter 14 is directly targeted to the church, and these disciples are going to be the foundation of the church. And so they needed some instruction here on the front end on what they needed to know and understand about the church and how it would operate in the New Testament age. I want want to divide our study up just into three areas. Uh, One, I want to look a little bit at the background of this passage that is established in the prior verses before we come to John chapter 14. And then I want to look at John 14 verses 1 through 6 just briefly with you. I want to look then at the final section of our study, which will be to look at the passage and just review it briefly in light of eschatological truth or truth regarding prophecy and what's going to take place and relate it to that, because I think it's helpful to us in that arena. I have some slides I want to show you. I'm going to break away just for a moment here and bring those up so we can look at those together, and hopefully they'll help you understand some background for this passage that we are directing our attention to here in John chapter 14. The first thing I want to remind you of is that when we come to chapter 14, because of a lot of these things that have gone on ahead of time that our Lord has already said to them in this context, this is a time of tremendous upheaval for the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. First thing I want to point out to you is that Jesus is reminding them that he is going to be leaving them. Now, this is really not new truth to them because he had spoken to them on other occasions of his impending death and resurrection but they really hadn't gotten the picture i think and so our lord reminds them again here in john chapter 13 verse 33 of this truth and here he says little children i'm i'm with you a little while longer you will seek me and as i said to the jews now i also say to you where i'm going you cannot come And so the Lord Jesus is going to be leaving them, and imagine this. He is their hero. He is the Messiah, of course, and they have given up their all to follow him, to be devoted to him in his life and service. And so this is a tremendous blow to them to understand that their hero was going to be leaving them. 
Then in chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, there is a, a further reminder that he's going to suffer and he's going to die. In this passage, he says to them, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So he was going to suffer and die. And again, we are within 24 hours of that time right here as we as we step into this arena and listen to our Lord speak to his followers is not going to be long. And he is going to be seen on the cross, not looking like a figure who is victorious, but looking like a picture of defeat, even though we know that it was very much a time of victory for our Savior. And then in uh, chapter 12, 22 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 31, we have our Lord addressing, he really addresses Peter here, but the you is plural in here, as I have mentioned in this uh, slide. So he's also talking to all of them. And he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And so the adversary is going to come against all of the disciples, and their faith is going to be tested in a monumental way through their lives and through their ministry. That certainly was borne out. And as you look at the history of the men who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you certainly see the evidence of this in their lives. Then there is a statement also that a, a disciple is going to betray him. And we find that in John chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. This was beyond the imagination of the disciples who had gathered there. And even when the Lord Jesus essentially identified Judas Iscariot, they were puzzled about these statements and about what was taking place. But the announcement that, that someone would betray the Lord Jesus Christ was beyond their imagination as they listened to our Lord in this context. And then in chapter 13, verses 37 and 38, we have the reminder that Peter is going to deny the Lord. Well, all these circumstances were going to come about for the Lord Jesus, and Peter, of course, was quite brash at this point in his life. And in verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. And what a prediction that is, that that very evening, the disciple, the follower of the Lord Jesus, Peter, is going to deny his knowledge of who the Lord Jesus Christ was. Peter would deny him, but as we also read in Mark chapter 14, verse 15, all the disciples fled him. Uh, during the hours his, of his greatest need. Uh, I just find that amazing. Although we wonder what would you and I do in that context, but the disciples who had lived with the Lord Jesus Christ and traveled with him for these years of his life and ministry, they all fled him at that time, the time of his trials prior to his crucifixion. So what a tough time and what a number of very difficult things the disciples heard in these moments leading up to chapter 14, you can imagine if you're one of the disciples that your life is crumbling right before your eyes. They had devoted themselves to this man. They still had in their minds, no doubt, the idea of, of a glorious kingdom and thought that the, this Messiah would bring that kingdom in at this point in time. But the kingdom had been rejected long, long ago, long before this. Now to hear that their hero would, would suffer and die and that all these other things would take place was very difficult for them to understand. Well, uh, there are a number of important verses as we turn to John chapter 14, and obviously we begin with number one, and the text says, do not let your heart be troubled. Stop letting it be anxious and agitated. Believe in God, believe also in me. So as I've mentioned here, faith answers our anxiety, or as someone has put it, trust brings tranquility. I want to remind you today that we really, uh, I think this is a lifetime venture. We we need to spend a great deal of time building our faith because I don't know anybody whose life doesn't collapse at one time or another. And how will we respond to that? And here our Lord is telling them when their lives seem to be in disarray, how they need to respond. They need to, as they have believed in God, they need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. You know, we walk by faith. We don't walk, walk by sight. 
and we need to cultivate and develop that faith in our lives. Well, the disciples needed a strong dose of faith here. They needed to they needed to enrich their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him, the one who was standing before them within 24 hours of his death. But Christ is going to have to go and prepare a place for his bride. In verse 2, the text says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So he's talking about the Father's house here, and in it there are many dwelling places. I remember the old song that I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Maybe some of you have heard that old song as well. I don't know that mansions is really the idea of the term here, but really the, the Greek word is related to the idea of abiding places or to abide or to remain. What those exactly look like, we really don't know. But our Lord said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And so to this place, Christ has to go to prepare a place for his bride, his eventual bride. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And so the bridegroom is going to come for the bride and take the bride to the place that he has prepared for her here in the Father's house. Well, the church is the bride of Christ, and those of us who today are members of the family of, of God are part of the church. And so our Lord had to leave to prepare this place for us in the context, again, of the, the Jewish wedding, preparing a place for his bride, and he would come one day and take that bride away to the place prepared in his father's home. So the location where we are going to go is where he is going. And he is going back to the house of the Father or the dwelling place of the Father. I go and prepare a place for you. I'll come again and receive you or take you away to myself that where I am there you may be also. So keep that in mind that it's heaven where he's going to take these disciples and by extension the entire church because as I mentioned they are the foundation of the church as, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. Well, we also see another very important verse here that's kind of embedded itself into the the mindset of, of many believers, and that is Christ's self-identity in this passage. Christ is unique and exclusive, and he indicates that in chapter 14, verse 6. The text is answering Thomas, who said in verse 5, uh, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, as you see here on the slide, the way, he is the way to God. He is the only way to God, and he is the only way by which we can have a relationship with the God of the universe. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He presents himself as the truth. He is utterly dependable. We can attach verity to everything that he says. How contrasting this is to our chief adversary who we see in John 8 44 is the father of lies not true with Christ he is absolutely dependable in what he is communicating to his followers and then the text says uh, our Lord says I'm the life he's my title to eternal life because when I believe him when I trust him as my personal savior his grant to me is eternal life that is now my present position. That is now my present possession. And it's all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have eternal life because of him. But then he makes this statement at the end of the verse that says, no one comes through the Father but through me. You'll recognize immediately that that goes counterculture to our world today because people today want to say, oh, whatever religion you are, whatever you believe, as long as you're sincere, uh, it's you're going to be in God's home at some point. You're going to go be with God. That is not what the Word of God teaches, because the Word of God teaches, and Christ here teaches his own uniqueness and his own exclusiveness. He is the only way to the Father, and so belief in the Lord Jesus Christ is the way that we have a relationship with the eternal God of the universe, of the universe that he has created. What an important statement this is regarding our personal salvation. I hope today that you're a member of God's family, by the way. That only happens through 
faith uh, by by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone as we believe in him Paul and Silas said there in the, the book of Acts chapter 16 when the Philippian jailer said sirs what do I have to do to be saved and they said to him believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and if your household follows the same pattern they also will be saved and so he is the only way and in him we find salvation and in him alone in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ I like the way an old scholar has put this, his, his name was Lenski, and he put it this way, if there is no Jesus, there is no way, no truth, no life. The way, the truth, and the life are gone if there is no Lord Jesus Christ, but we have all of that in our Savior. What a precious picture that is. Well, again, as we look at these verses here, uh, I want to remind you that uh, this is a primary passage in relation to the doctrine of the rapture. So we're moving right now to that section where I said we want to apply this to prophetic truth and apply it to eschatological issues. It is one of the prior, it is one of the primary passages, as I mentioned earlier, especially the first three verses, John 14, verses one through three. Also, we have, as I mentioned before, the uh, passages by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. But this is a this is a major one. The the first announcement of of what is going to happen to members of the family of God. And it's a beautiful proclamation that we see here. But uh it is I just want to tell you it's agreed on by pre-tribulational people and post-tribulational people that this is a rapture passage. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms, I know many of you are, but the tribulation period is a period of time. It's the 70th week of Daniel. It is going to come upon this earth. It's a time of, of tremendous uh, uh, wrath of God poured out on this earth and a time of tremendous suffering. Any who are converts during that time, I think most of them will lose their lives for the cause of Christ. That There are people who have have been saved, have come to faith in Christ after the church is taken out. So when we say pre-tribulational, it means that we as a church will be taken out before the tribulation period comes to this earth, the 70th week of Daniel. Well, that doesn't mean we won't have persecution. I read an article just recently within the last week or so indicating that persecution of, of Christians is, is rising all over our world. And I think we see a lot of that in our own country here, the United States of America. We may very well have persecution. And in uh, the writings of the the Voice of the Martyrs and also Dr. John Walbert, who was a president of Dallas Theological Seminary for many years and a great prophetic scholar, both of these sources said in the 20th century that 300 people a day, either directly or indirectly, because of their fidelity to Christ, lost their lives. And so there is a lot of suffering. And again, in certain places of the world today, tremendous suffering if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that doesn't mean we will not have tribulation in our lives, because that is very common. It's endemic to being a Christian and living in a hostile world and being a follower of Christ who is also hated by the world system. But I do believe every evidence of the scripture is that we are delivered from this actual tribulation period that is going to come to earth. In fact, Daniel is told in Daniel 9 that this is really for his people and for his the city, uh, the tribulation period. And then we read, of course, in the book of Revelation that earth dwellers are going to be judged regularly throughout this period of time as well. So earth dwellers and and the people of Israel are going to the people of Israel are going to be purified during this time until they call out for their Messiah and for him to return and to deliver them because he's their only hope. But the church itself, I believe, will be taken out before the tribulation period begins. Now, the post tribulational point of view says post obviously tells you after that the rapture of the church will be after the tribulation period, that that is when we join the Lord Jesus in the air. So there are a number of people today who take that position, the post-tribulational rapture. Just telling you right here that both groups do believe this passage is a rapture passage. We also see, as I mentioned briefly earlier here, a background of the Jewish wedding in this, because the bridegroom is Christ, and he is, is going to go prepare a place for his bride, the church, just as the the Jewish young man would prepare a place for his bride to live and then go take her from her home to, to his father's house. 
our Lord is going to do that. And he he returns to take her to the location he has prepared in the Jewish framework. And here is the location that Jesus is going to prepare for his church. He will come and take us to that, to that location, to the very presence of the Heavenly Father himself. Well, this this feature is very key, key so I'm, and, uh, I am emphasizing it again, that he takes us to where he is, where he is going, and he is going, he is leaving these men on earth as he goes to the Father's house, and this is heaven. That is where Jesus is going, the place to which he is returning, and he is going to prepare that place for us and come take us to himself or receive us to himself, and we will go be where he is going at that time. That's a very important key component, I believe, of the pre-tribulational rapture idea. So our destiny is heaven at this point, not earth. And in the post-trib point of view, really the destiny is earth, because the idea is that you meet the Lord in the air and come right back down to earth, but you, you don't get to the Father's house, which is what Jesus says here is the place to which we are going. We are going to the Father's house, but in the post-tribulational viewpoint, you just meet the Lord Jesus in the air and come right back to the earth. And so our Lord couldn't say in that context then that we're going to the father's house but that is what he says here so we know he's preparing a place for us in his father's presence and he will come take us to that location it also this is not a judgment picture here as as the second coming is there are many judgments that are going to take place at the time of the second coming but this is one that reflects the intimacy of a bride uh, and her bridegroom and that's what the Lord Jesus is talking about here as the bridegroom. He's going to catch his bride away. That's you and that's me if you're a member of the family of God. And I know that I am. So he's going to catch me away to be with himself. And then from that point on, Paul will tell us in First Thess Thessalonians 4, we'll, we'll be with him forever. Never again a break in our relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. What an important statement that is especially in defending the pre-tribulational rapture. There are a lot of other reasons I think we can defend that as well. So I'm not resting that case just on this passage. I'm saying this passage supports that idea that we will be taken out before the tribulation period because we're actually going to the Father's house and not into the earthly kingdom directly. Then this also helps us retain a distinction between Israel and the church. And uh, none of prophecy will make sense if you don't really realize that there is a distinct program for Israel and there is a distinct program for the church. Today, uh, members of, of the church are Jew and Gentile. Paul addresses this issue in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and in chapter 3, how what God has done in bringing a body together of Jews and Gentiles. So it's made up of both. But uh, there is still a, a unique program for Israel, and the tribulation period is the 70th week of Daniel. As I said earlier, it'll be used to purify them, to bring them to the point where they cry out for the Messiah to return, the one they rejected in his first coming, and, and the Messiah will come and deliver them and will establish his kingdom here on earth. The church has a wonderful role in that kingdom as well because we return with him and revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 we read there that we're going to reign with him here on earth as he reigns in, over his kingdom so uh there's overlap i mean both both groups function but there's a distinct difference in programs because the the jewish people didn't look forward to the rapture as i mentioned it was never referred to in the old testament because the church was unknown but the Jewish people look forward to a kingdom and a king and land and all the things that were promised to them, promises embedded in the great covenants of the Old Testament. And they are going to be raised to go into the, the kingdom that Messiah will establish and enjoy those privileges and those benefits that they will receive at that time. The programs are different, even though they overlap time-wise. John chapter 17 is the great high priestly prayer of our Lord. It's a beautiful prayer that is offered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 5, he says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He's praying here to his heavenly Father. He knows he is headed to the cross, but he's longing for the return of that glory that he had with the Father 
before the world was. Then we come to this 24th verse in this high priestly prayer, and it is a, an amazing verse to me because our Lord prays intimately to his Father, and one of the desires that he expresses is right here. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you have for you love me before the foundation of the world. I find that astounding. My Savior looks forward to that point when I will be with him, which will come through the resurrection uh, or and or the rapture for those who are living at the time of Christ's return. Isn't this amazing? We will see the glory of our Lord, which will not be veiled in any way when we step into his presence. What a precious picture this is. He's looking for the, uh, forward to that time when I'm with him there in his father's presence and see that glory that is going to be returned to him based on his prayer in chapter 17, verse 5. I think how wonderful. I've read about these spectacular appearances of, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures to uh, Moses in Exodus 34 and to Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel and Ezekiel chapter 1, Habakkuk and Habakkuk chapter 3. And those are incredible Old Testament pictures of the glory and brilliance of our God. I thrill and rejoice as I read them, but I read them off the pages of scripture. I'm actually going to see that glory one day. And then John, of course, in John chapter 1, also was given a revelation of the, the post-incarnate Christ as he appeared to John in that passage as John was going to have to write some very difficult things, and, and he is comforted there by the presence of his Savior. What a verse this is. I desire that they also, Father, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. What a glorious thing that's going to be in an instant, in the resurrection and or in the rapture itself. I am going to see the Lord Jesus Christ and all the fullness of his glory that was given to him by the Father before he came to this earth. That is just absolutely marvelous. Well, I want you to understand that this is uh, the first major rapture passage and it is information communicated to the disciples just on the eve of our Lord's our Lord's crucifixion. And there are promises here uh, embedded in the passage that perhaps they still did not understand. And I think it was after the resurrection of Christ and after the day of Pentecost that they were galvanized with the truth of his resurrection. And it became embedded into their preaching and into their lives. Here they are still bewildered by these circumstances and and uh, disrupted because their their savior, their Lord, their master is going to be leaving them. So what comfort God brings to them that uh, in Christ, uh, a place is going to be prepared for them. And the Lord Jesus, the bridegroom will come again and receive them unto himself. And that's my future and your future. Do you understand from this passage that our destiny is heaven at this point, not earth? And hence, I believe it's pre-tribulational. I believe heaven is where we are headed. I think we will go through there, the Bema, the, the judgment seat of Christ, and certainly the wedding of the Lamb. And those are going to be incredible features of our time in heaven while the tribulation period is, is taking place here on earth. We are going to heaven. Uh, the post-tribulationists must affirm that we are going to earth. That's not what Jesus says here. He's going to take us to these abiding places that are in his Father's house. Well, for a number of reasons, I would rule out a post-tribulational rapture. It really does not make a lot of sense. As I mentioned earlier, the tribulation is not for the church. That's pretty clear when, when we understand the, the message to Daniel in chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. It's for the holy city and for his people, the people of Israel. You realize that there also has to be a group of people that will uh, naturally repopulate the earth. There'll be probably a small group to begin with, but everybody who starts the the millennial kingdom will be in natural bodies. Those who go in from the tribulation period, Matthew 24, 13 speaks of that time when all those who are saved or delivered will, will go into the kingdom. And those in natural bodies will be those who will start to repopulate the earth. But if all converts go up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, they would receive glorified bodies. 
who would be left to repopulate the earth as it will be repopulated during the millennial kingdom? So uh, be be clear about the timing of the rapture. I'm I'm confident that for many reasons we can we can establish the fact that it, it takes place before the tribulation period. You know, every other rapture position, and there are several, we've talked about the post-tribulational rapture. There's also a mid-trib view. There's a pre-wrath view. There's a partial rapture view. But in all of these other views, you are not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ. You're looking for the Antichrist. And those of us who hold to the pre-tribulational viewpoint are privileged to be able to be looking for the coming of Jesus for us at the time of the resurrection and the rapture of the church. What a blessing that is. Now, the most important thing that I can say to you today is to make sure you are rapture ready, to make sure you are ready to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that that takes place when you have placed your faith by grace alone, through faith alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, and are trusting him alone for your eternal destiny. When we trust him, his grant to us is the grant of eternal life. And I rest in assurance of that because it's based on the promise of the Lord Jesus to those who listen to his words. Trust him today, believe in him today, and then you, like I, will be rapture ready. I'm looking for the rapture, the time when the bridegroom comes for his bride, and that's me and all others who have trusted him as Savior. Have a blessed day, keep your eye on the sky, and serve waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus.